Hey guys, so today I want to talk to you about this concept of religion versus sonship. Um, and this is a very important video, guys, for some of the people that are watching. Uh, there are many people out there who call themselves Christians, um, who have deceived themselves into thinking that they're children of God on the basis of their own righteousness. The things that they do or don't do, their efforts at self-denial, their efforts at harsh treatment of the body and religious codes and doctrines, their own efforts at um, handing God their own righteousness and their own works, thinking that by them uh, that they have right standing before the Father. And the Bible is very clear about this, guys, that anyone who seeks to be made right with God by the law is under a curse. And the law, guys, that includes the Ten Commandments. It was the Ten Commandments written on stone tablets, which Paul calls in 2 Corinthians a ministration of death and condemnation. So if you are trying to approach the Father um, and please the Father by your own righteousness and on the basis of your own efforts, um, that's something that you really need to think about, guys, all right? Because it is Christ and Christ alone with whom God is well pleased. And under the new covenant, um, to be in right standing with the Father, you have to be in Christ. It's based on him, his efforts, his righteousness, his finished work, not ours, okay? Um, and unfortunately, there are many people who are trusting in themselves and their own efforts and their own religion and the things they do versus the things they don't do, their own efforts, their own righteousness, and they fooled themselves into thinking that they're in good standing with God on the basis of these things. And unfortunately, it's going to be many of those people on the day of judgment who hear the words of Jesus, go away from me, I never knew you. What does he mean by that? I never knew you. It means he never knew these people. Why did he never know them? Because they never trusted in him and in him alone. All right. God has provided the way of salvation. That way of salvation is a person. This is why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody gets to the father but by me. It is Christ with whom God is well pleased. In order to be right with God, you must be approaching God through the Son. Okay? Um, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 10 regarding, to, regarding the religious Jews, the religious Israelites who are rejecting the Messiah on account of their own righteousness. He says that they're zealous for God, but in ignorance. In going about trying to establish their own righteousness on account of the law, they have rejected the righteousness of God, which is Christ. Christ is the righteousness of God. And so in their religious zeal and their ignorance, going about trying to establish their own righteousness by the law, they have rejected the righteousness of God, which is Christ. And he goes on to say that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. Now, that word law there, it encompasses all of it. The Ten Commandments, all of it. No man will be made righteous by the works of the law. No man will be justified by the works of the law. Romans chapter 3, guys, okay? This is said so many times throughout the Bible and people don't want to hear it. In fact, religious people get very angry when you tell them this. Just like Cain got very angry when his offering was rejected. Because religious people are doing the same thing as Cain. Okay, They're offering you what they believe to be the better sacrifice. Cain offered the fruits of his own labor, the crops from his field that he labored over. He thought that this was the better sacrifice, okay? Meanwhile, Abel over here, he just offered up the blood sacrifice, right? Abel, uh, you know, Abel did the right thing. He offered up the blood sacrifice, but Cain's over here thinking that surely his sacrifice, his offering to God is much better. He offers up the fruits of his own labor, his labor over the field of, of the ground that he toiled in, right? Meanwhile, Abel's just offering the blood. Surely my, my offering, my sacrifice, God will receive over Abel's. 
And when God rejected Cain's sacrifice, what did Cain do? He got very angry and conspired to murder his brother who offered the correct sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. Guys, that's a reference to Christ. You have to understand that, okay? And this is exactly what happens when you tell what I'm telling you now to a religious person. The religious person is out there, you know, suffering, toiling, running the hamster meal, trying to deny themselves. They're miserable. They're doing everything they can to make themselves as miserable as possible, all so that they can be made right with God. And when you tell them that all of that is garbage and accounts for nothing, they get very, very angry. And what do they do? They react like Cain and they want to murder their brother who offered the blood. Um, and so when a person screams grace, grace, when they trust on the finished work of Christ, when they offer up the sacrifice of Abel, the blood sacrifice, that makes religious people very angry because it takes their offering and throws it on the ground as worthless, okay, as dirty rags, as filthy rags. And they get very angry when you do this. So religious people, and many of you may be watching this now, might be those religious people. If what I'm telling you is making you angry, chances are you are religious and not a child of God. There's a big difference, guys, all right? I want you guys to be able to see this. I want to give you a perfect example of this, okay? Let's go to this, the, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. This is Jesus' parable, okay? This is starting in Luke chapter 18, verse 9, all right? Now he, Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Guys, I want you to understand that that verse is the basis of everything Jesus is going to say in his parable. I'm going to repeat it, okay? Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and began praying this in regard to himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, crooked, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now, what is it that the Pharisee was boasting before God with? His own efforts his own works, his own righteousness. Don't you see, God, I'm working so hard. I'm tithing. I'm giving to the poor. I'm giving all my tithes. Thank you, God, that I'm not an adulterer or a swindler or this tax collector, this filthy tax collector over here. He's boasting in himself. Lord, Lord, did I not do many great works in your name? Guys, do you understand that it's that man that Jesus just mentioned? that's going to hear the words, go away from me, I never knew you. What was the person in Matthew 7 offering up to God? God, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do many wonders and cast out devils in your name? Didn't I do many great works in your name? That's what they're offering God. They're offering God the sacrifice of, a of Cain and not Abel. That's why he says, go away from me. I never knew you. They never want, they, they weren't trying to enter the kingdom by the gate. They were trying to get in by some other way. John chapter 10. They weren't going on account of Christ. It's Christ with, who, with whom God is well pleased. You must enter through him, not through your own righteousness and your own efforts. Whatever they may be, as zealous as you are, you might starve yourself to death. God doesn't want your filthy rags. He is well pleased with his son, Jesus Christ. And if you want to be made right with God, you must come before him through Christ. Now, some will protest and they'll say, well, Jesus says, go away from me. I never knew you. You who work lawlessness and they will cling to that verse where jesus says that these are people that are being condemned because of lawlessness but guys we who are in christ are they who what in romans chapter 7 we have died to the law so that we can marry another 
And where there is no law, there is no transgression. That's what Paul says. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. We died to the law. The law can no longer condemn us. We are not considered lawless because we died to the law. Those who are considered lawless are those who are still being judged by the law. This is why Jesus says to those very same people in the book of John, on the day of judgment, it will not be I who condemns you. It will be Moses who you have trusted in who condemns you. What does he mean by that? Moses is a representation of the law. These people are trusting in their own righteousness on account of the law. That's why he declares them lawless or workers of iniquity. The Christian who's hidden in Christ has died to the law. And where there is no law, there is no sin. There is no condemnation. That's why there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? That's why Paul says that in Romans 8, right after he got done in Romans 7, talking about dying to the law. We are not condemned. There is no condemnation for us because our sin and the law has been nailed to the cross. Colossians chapter 2. Understand? We're not workers of iniquity. We're not workers of lawlessness because we died to the law. The law and all of our sin have been done away with. We're hidden in Christ. All right? So, let's continue. Now, one of the things that you'll see a lot from religious people, and you might notice these things in yourself if you are one of those religious people, is that they are obsessed with critiquing other people's outward deeds. So, their hobbies... Um, whether they watch television or not, whether they watch movies or not, do you play video games? What, they're obsessed with trying to judge the outward appearance because in their own lives, in their own mind, and in their own heart, those are the things that they believe they must approach God with. Okay, In order for them to be made right with God, in their mind, they have to do all of these religious things in order to be good enough um, to, to be rendered... Uh, pleasing in God's sight. So they approach God based on all of these things. And so they're very quick to be judging other people based on these things. And we saw this, um, and it, we see this all over Christianity. I mean, somehow drinking alcohol has become a sin, despite the fact that Jesus's very first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding, okay? Um, that Jesus himself admits that he drank alcohol, okay? Um, I came eating and drinking, he says. He's not talking about apple juice, guys. Um, you know, but somehow religion has turned drinking alcohol into a sin. The Bible declares drunkenness a sin. It doesn't declare alcohol sinful, but religion has done this because this is what religion does. Religion adds to the things of God. Watching television, going to movies, uh, this was all, you would go to hell for doing these things in certain denominations of Christianity. Still today, especially here in the Bible Belt where I live. Um, playing video games, playing cards, dancing. In the Pentecostal movement, God forbid a woman wears pants, she's going straight to hell. Uh, if she wears makeup, etc., etc., etc. We have made all of these extra biblical um, judgments on people um, and, and added all of these traditions of men to somehow bolster our own righteousness. And something that you'll notice that's very common with these individuals is they're so obsessed with these outward religious things, but they're usually blatantly oblivious to how wretched they are on the inside. Perfect example of this. Uh, that video that I did recently that, that uh, got pretty popular where the Lord gave me that word about Zerubbabel. I happened to mention that I got the word while I was playing video games. I can't tell you how many times I had to deal with people judging me because I play video games, all right? I had one individual um, go on and on about how I'm ungodly because I play video games. I'm, I'm sharing with you a word that the Lord gave me, um, a prophetic word that the Lord gave me that I've never received before, and you're too busy judging my, my hobbies to understand what the Lord is saying. And this is what Jesus means when he says that these people are white 
washed tombs. They're so concerned with cleaning the outside of the cup, and yet inwardly they're filthy. What do I mean by that? What does Jesus mean by that when he says it? If you listen to some of these people in the comment section, the, the very moment that you reject what they're saying when they're judging you about video games or whatever, watch them go into a fit of rage, cuss you out, say every kind of nasty thing they can imagine, throw out insults, call you names, watch them act like the devil. But they're so concerned with video games and they're totally oblivious to what's going on inside their heart. That pride and self-righteousness, that malice, that wickedness in here, totally oblivious to it. But God forbid you're playing video games. No, no, no. And this is what I mean with religious people. This is what Jesus means when he calls them whitewashed tombs. They're beautiful on the outside, but inwardly they're dead men's bones. They're so convinced with what people are doing out here in the physical world and they don't understand that God sees this. This is what he cares about. He doesn't care about whether you're riding motorcycles or you're playing video games or whether you're watching television. What he cares about is this. Okay? This is why Paul says what he says in, in, in Colossians 2. Let no man be your judge uh, based on religious principles, on the temporary things of the world. Do not touch. Do not handle. Do not taste. They have the appearance of religion and worthiness in that they're harsh on the body and that they're self-made rules to appear religious, but they're of no benefit, okay? That's why Paul says what he says in 2 Colossians, all right? And those of you out there who are going to take issue with what I'm saying, I'll give you a biblical story to prove the point that I'm saying. Back in the Old Testament, the book of 2 Kings, the story of Naaman, I have talked about this before in my videos. I'm going to quickly recount it because I don't want to, for sake of time, continuously go over it and go through it. But I encourage you to go to 2 Kings and read the whole story of Naaman for yourself so that you can see I'm not making it up. Naaman was a Syrian. He was a Gentile, unbeliever. He was a pagan man. He served a king of this pagan country inside the temple to a pagan god. He had leprosy, which was the ultimate symbol of being unclean, all right? He went searching everywhere to find somebody that could heal him of his leprosy, but he couldn't find any. Finally, he comes in contact with this Jewish girl. The Jewish girl tells him to go to Israel and see the prophet Elisha because Elisha can heal him. So he goes and gets permission from the king to go to Israel. He makes this long journey to Israel to see Elisha so that he can be healed of his leprosy. Now, Please understand that at this time, Naaman doesn't know anything about the God of Israel. He's not a believer. He's a pagan, serves a false God, knows nothing about the God of Israel, but he's just going so that he can be healed of his leprosy, okay? Has nothing to offer the God of Israel but his own wickedness and idolatry, okay? Goes to Elisha. Elisha tells him to go dip himself in the Jordan seven times. Please understand that this is a reference to the gospel message. Here's this man with the ultimate symbol of uncleanliness. He's covered in leprosy, which is an unclean rot or disease, a bacterial infection. And it's looked at as the most unclean, it's the most, uh, the epitome of being unclean. This is what leprosy was, okay? Tells him to go dip himself in the Jordan. It's a reference to baptism. It's a reference to the gospel message. He comes out. He's totally cleansed of his leprosy as a free gift. He didn't have anything to offer the God of Israel didn't pay for it, had nothing to offer, didn't even truly believe in the God of Israel until he was healed, comes out as a free gift, he's completely healed. In his um, happiness and his joy, he runs back to Elijah, wants to offer him some kind of repayment for this gift that he's been given, and Elisha rebukes him and says, may I never receive payment for this gift. Understand this is referencing the gospel message. Salvation is a free gift. Here's this pagan Gentile man, he's not even Jewish, has nothing to offer the God of Israel but his own sin and wickedness. He's freely cleansed by the waters of life, brought out of his wickedness and his uncleanness, made a new creature, right, by a free gift. He offered nothing, had nothing to offer and nothing to repay, all right? So now he's got a problem because Naaman has to go back to his country 
where he serves this king who serves a pagan god. Now, one of Naaman's jobs for the king is to work inside the temple of this pagan god, okay? And so now Naaman has to go back to his former life and he's concerned. I've got to go back to the king and serve the king in this temple of this God that I no longer believe in. What is God, the God of Israel, going to think of me? Is he going to judge me? Is he going to condemn me? Is he going to be angry with me that I have to serve this false God that I no longer believe in? So he goes to Elijah and he tells him this. And Elisha says to him, no, you're going to go to hell if you go back to uh, Syria and you serve that false God in that temple. No. No, that's not what Elijah says. Elijah says to this man, Shalom, go in peace. I want you to stop and think about that for a second. This man asks the prophet Elijah if it's okay, if God will know his heart, if he goes back to this pagan country that he came from and he has to go back into this pagan temple and serve this pagan God that he no longer believes in, if God will know his heart or if God will be angry. And the prophet says to Naaman, go in peace. Shalom. You just sit for a couple of seconds and take that in. That's the God of, of Israel. He loves us. Once saved, always saved. Once a child of God, always a child of God. Salvation is a free gift. God is concerned about this. He's not concerned about this. That's what the Bible says. Are you religious or are you a child of God? I love you guys.